All right, everyone, how's it going? I'm going to be doing another, I don't want to say it's like an interview practice problem, but it's just like some React really basic um, beginner practice that you can do to kind of make sure that you're good at React or you kind of understand like how you can build something in React. Um, so I have a V app set up, bare bones, like nothing special has been changed. And the idea of what we're trying to build in this video is that we want to build a kind of like a thesaurus using a third party API. So there's an API called DataMuse. And the goal is like, let's say you're in an interview and someone asks you that you need to make a, an application where you can type in a word, like search, and it gives you back all of the synonyms that uh, are for that word or whatever else that you want. And all they tell you is that this is the API website that you have to use. And here is the project that you have to get going. So could you do that? Could you figure something out and build something? Um, and how much guidance would you need to get that going? So. Let's try doing that together. This is going to be a live coding session, so there's going to be stuff that uh, I probably mess up on, but the name of the game. So let's just go ahead and go to our app.tsx, and I'm going to delete everything so we start with like a bare bones project here. And for the most part, like you can stick with the, the default app CSS stuff. Like you can bring in CSS modules. It's really up to you. And the more that you show that you know, like let's say you decide that you want to change this to an app.module.css, that just shows that you know more about front end development and stuff, and you know, different approaches for styling. So let's just start off with the first thing is we wanted to basically have an input box that a user can type in a word and click a search button. Okay. So first thing I'd probably do is we'd make a form, right? Typically for correct semantic HTML, you want to have a form and inside of that form, you could probably have a label and you could also have an input. Okay. Now you could also kind of explain along the way that the reason I'm adding a label is because I want to make this accessible. So I'm going to say HTML4 and I will say word uh, input. And then if you can show that, okay, here I can say word, your word. Go over here and make sure that shows up. And I want to make sure that when I click on this label, it actually focuses on the input box, right? Because that's good for accessibility. So what I'm going to do is add an ID here called word input. And now when I click on this, it actually focuses on the input. Okay. So it's good to kind of make sure that you kind of, you know, can explain that because accessibility is really important when you're building out front end applications. And inside the input itself, we want to keep track of when the user actually types into it. So if you can kind of flex your knowledge with React and how do you store state on a dynamically changing input? Well, first of all, you probably need to get some state here. So I'm going to say word and set word equals use state. And we are using TypeScript here. So you can kind of flex your chop, your uh, TypeScript chops if you want and say, well, I could put um, string in here with the generics, which will basically type this already to a string. Over over here it says string. Or if I just want to use the inferred types of TypeScript, I could just go ahead and put an empty string here. And now this thing is going to be a string. Okay. And now when you change this input, so on change, we want to basically take what the user's typed in, and I would just say set word of e.target.value. And that should hopefully update this state. So again, if you're doing a live coding and they're actually watching you code, if you can show that like stuff's actually working as you're implementing it and kind of show them that rapid feedback cycle, if you go to the components tab and make sure that you have the React um, dev tool set up. And if you don't like ask them if you can install it or something, over here, you can actually hover on the app and you can show them that you understand how to actually look at state. So when someone types in the word um, fast, you'll notice that this state updates down here. You can also modify this and I can change it to slow. And notice that typing slow here did not update the input. So we have to kind of do the next part of this, which is we need to make this a, um, I think it's called a controlled component or uncontrolled. I've already forgotten. So you guys can fail me on this interview if you want. But basically you need to add a value in an on change so that when a user types into this input, it will basically update the state. Um, now I am going to go ahead and Google that because I don't want to teach you guys something completely wrong. I just forgotten the terms. I think if it is controlled or uncontrolled is typically like when you use like a ref or something. So like you can access the value of the input, but you use like a ref. So in our case, we are using a controlled. So I think I did say that right. But yeah, let's just go ahead and type in a word like fast or slow. And we want to basically, when the user press enter, we want to do a request to an API endpoint. Okay. So first of all, if you can kind of highlight the fact that this is inside a form and when you click enter on this, it's going to automatically submit the form 
And secondly, we don't have a button, right? Typically, you should probably have a submit button. So let's just add a button here, and I will just say submit, just to make sure that thing shows up. And I don't know why the styling of this button is so dark. Um, let's go on the app CSS and see if like they're already styling some buttons or something. But they're not, so let's just go ahead and style the button, and we'll do this, and uh, let's just give it like a background of pink. We're gonna make this the most ugly form ever, and we have to figure out why is it not actually styling the button. Um, and it turns out that I think some of the stuff is actually hard coded somewhere. So let's go ahead and do a full project search to find where that's coded, hard coded, and it looks like they've already hard coded with the Vite setup to this. So I'm gonna go ahead and make it something a little bit lighter since we're we are in dark mode. I mean, this part isn't really that important. Like, honestly, the functionality is more important. If you're trying to, like, get a job for, like, being a really good CSS, like, front-end designer or styler, then, like, yeah, maybe you need to be able to highlight the fact that you could use uh, BEM for styling your form or your page. You could bring in style components. You could bring in um, Tailwind CSS. It doesn't really matter. I'm not big on, like, styling. It just doesn't matter to me. Um, CSS modules works fine as well which I kind of mentioned. But basically, when someone submits this form, you can listen to that with an onSubmit. And I'll just go ahead and call a function. Now, what I like to do in React is I like to say anything that is calling a function, I like to call it handle form submit. And you can also make it more specific or um, like instead of like handle form submit, that doesn't really describe what's happening here. But really, it's saying handle um, fetch synonyms. I don't even know how to spell that word. I'll be honest with you. English is like one of those classes in high school and college I just like barely, barely passed because I just, I'm so bad at grammar, I'm so bad at spelling, I'm also pretty bad at speaking. Yeah, I think I spelled it right. So the idea of the app is like we need to get um, the synonyms, right? So this thing, the handle fetch synonyms, this is the kind of the convention I like to use, put handle as a prefix on your function so you can call it like this. And when you call this method, always remember that you need to e pre prevent default or else this form is going to refresh your page. You can kind of talk about that in your in your interview or whatever and kind of show that like you know how a traditional HTML form will submit um, data to a backend API using like an action. Like typically if you put like an action here on the form, uh, I believe you can say like, uh, you can put like a URL. I think you can also do a method. I haven't done like a traditional HTML form in so long. Like if I comment this out, and delete this. I want to show you something. I know I kind of just went off the hinges on like something completely unrelated, but I think it's kind of good to teach anyway in case you don't know. So if I click submit here, um, see how it changed the URL to slash URL? Whatever you put this action in, and I believe method would be capital post. Um, oh, I don't have my network tab set up. Let's, let's go back real quick. So if I clear out the network tab and type in like hello, and then submit. If you look at this request, it's a post request to this endpoint. So typically with like traditional server-side rendering, you have a form, it posts some data to a backend, the backend processes that data, and then it refreshes the, the browser's client or redirects them to a different page. Or sometimes it just reloads the page with some additional data. Um, but I just went off on a complete tangent, so I apologize for that. But I do think it's important to understand because not many people really even know that um, and how traditional web applications used to work. So we're going to go ahead and say e.prevent the default in, I think we can say react.form event like this. So we can actually type this and we can get that nice IntelliSense to get that automatic prevent default to show up when we type. Um, but the next steps is we want to take the word that the user typed into the state and we want to send it somewhere, right? We want to get some synonyms. So now the next part of the challenge is like how good are you at reading through API documentation, right? How, how can you actually be resourceful and figure this stuff out for yourself? Like the, the interviewer could probably give you hints along the way, but really like they could just give you this URL and say, good luck. Like, let's see how well you are at digesting an open source API. Um, and usually you can just skip straight to like examples, right? So I'm going to go ahead and search for the word synonyms. And it looks like it pops up here. So SYN, let's try to figure out what this SYN thing means. If you scroll up a little bit, this refers to a code. And the code has to go, it looks like here, REL code. So how do I actually do this? Well, I see some examples of RELTRG here. So maybe what I could do 
is I could actually just hit the endpoint with rel underscore syn equals and then a word, right? So I don't even have to read through this stuff. I just have to kind of assume how the API works. And again, I could just click on this and let's see what happens. Let's see what we get back. Okay, we got some data back. It's an array of things. I'm gonna go ahead and just try to change this to syn up here and change it to fast and let's see what comes back. Okay, so we get a bunch of words back that come back. Uh, we get smooth, quick, fleet, swift. These are all synonyms for the word fast. So I think we, we kind of solved the uh, challenge of how do we actually get the synonyms and literally like it took what one minute to read through this real quick and just look at examples uh, granted I did kind of look at this API beforehand so if you can't do it in a minute like I did on video I'm kind of showing you a false you know reality but really it's it shouldn't be too hard to do that so how do you actually get that data okay so now you kind of show that you know how to do fetch right so in most browsers there's I guess I should say in all browsers there's a fetch method you can use to get data from an endpoint. So let's just go ahead and call that in a string, that same method. And I believe this will work, hopefully. Um, I don't know if like cores needs to be set up or some type of proxy needs to be set up. But let's just go ahead and make sure that when we submit, this can actually do a fetch request. So I'm gonna go ahead and type in fast. And I'm gonna go ahead and click submit. And it did a 200 status code back. It did a get request to this endpoint. Everything works fine. So we've kind of proven that we can actually from our front end, fetch some data and we get an array back of results. So now we need to store those results somewhere and display them, right? So how do you do that? Well, let's just go ahead and make another state variable called synonyms, synonyms, set synonyms. This is like the worst word for me for some reason, I cannot. Anyway, let's just grab that. And what we're gonna do is if you look at the data that comes back in the preview or the, the payload, you can either look at either of these Let's just look at the structure of this. Well, it's an array and it, each one has a word and a score, okay? So what I would do is I'll go ahead and just type this. I'll say type um, synonym equals a word and then a score, which is I believe a number, right? So it's good to type your stuff. There might be a SDK that already provides types for this, but I'm gonna go ahead and type this as an array of synonyms so that we can simply just do a dot then here and I'm gonna set the data that comes back. Um, and I forgot that this is fetch, so you have to actually do um, response and then response.json to get that array, and then I can set it. So now at this point, let's just kind of verify that we know what the heck's going on here. I'm gonna go back to my dev tools, and I'm gonna go ahead and type in fast and click submit. And uh, notice that the state inside this hooks thing, we have all of those words. So if you kind of understand React just a little bit, like the next step is how do you render these out to the page? Well, we can use a map. We have it stored in state here successfully. That's good. Um, and we can simply go underneath the form here and I can just do a map. So I'm gonna say curly brace this.map and then I'm gonna say synonym. And then for every synonym, I will do a fragment for right now. And um, let's just go ahead and render out the synonym, right? So I'll just go ahead and print out the word here. And in fact, I'll put it in a div so they're all in different lines or you could kind of be fancy and put this in an LI. Uh, it's really up to you. Again, like I wouldn't care about styling unless it's like super specific for a certain like styling role or something. I do want to say I don't interview people. So a lot of the stuff I'm telling you right here, like in, in the, when I, when I speak about like interviews and stuff, I'm just kind of saying like what I would do if I was interviewing people and try to see like what they, what they can do. Um, but notice here, if I go ahead and type in a word like slow in search, notice that. Uh, I don't know if it actually works. Let's go back and see. We have an error down here. Uh, each key in each child in the list should have unique key property, right? So sometimes I always forget this, especially when your linter is not set up. I don't know why Vite doesn't come with a, a built-in linter, uh, like ES linter or whatever, but typically you want to set up key here. And for every synonym that you give back, hopefully there's no duplicates. There might be. Uh, so we have to kind of think about that. If I do a search for slow, um, okay, how about hot? So at this point, I don't know if this is actually working. So I think there's a bug. And every time I click submit, I get the words back for fast, prompt, true, hot. Am I getting the exact same words every time? Um, let's try a different word that's like completely different. Okay. So. Um, one thing I completely forgot to do, which is fine. Like it's an interview, you get nervous, you forget things is 
I'm doing the exact same request fast, fast here. And although I'm typing in slime here, like sometimes you forget stuff. We're just human. We forget how to do stuff. We, we forget to overwrite some variables. Um, this is actually what we need to do. We need to interpolate that word that the user typed into state in the input, right? So that every time I do a submit, it's actually going to take the real word here. So now if I click submit, it's back some different things. So slow, uh, hot. Okay. So that's all working pretty good. I mean, we could style this up and make it look nice. Um, but it's also good to take it to the next next step is like, do you know how to like make your code a little bit cleaner? So let's just go up here and say like base URL is equal to this string. Uh, can't type for some reason. Let's go ahead and just do that. And let's just go ahead and interpolate the base URL here. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because Sometimes you want to run stuff locally and you might have a locally running like mock uh, API service. So you want to basically make this be configurable, which is sometimes very easy to do just by saying something like this. Uh, like I could say like API URL, um, that might be a little bit more descriptive. And I could just use that or I could fall back on a default. Okay. Now I don't know why process is complaining. I probably have to install something like this. Let me just go ahead and install those types to see if that'll go away. MPMI save dev types node. And hopefully it goes away. If not, um, this is like my first time really using Vite that much. Oh, not my first time. I used Vite a couple times, but not like with TypeScript. Okay, so that went away. And the idea is like you can actually start up your, uh, your app uh, with API URL of like, I don't know, HTTP localhost 10,000. Now, obviously this won't work. Like if I refresh the page, um, process is not defined. So I'd actually have to go look at Vite and try to figure out how can you set up environment variables on Vite because I haven't done it before. So Vite environment variables. And if like, if someone's like interviewing you and they give you access to Google, if you can show that you can go and Google stuff pretty well, then I would do that because it, it doesn't hurt to like show that you know how to learn, you know how to go and like look stuff up and be resourceful. But I think it's saying that Vite exposes environment variables on this special thing here. Okay, so that's on me. I didn't really, you know, haven't done that before. Kind of weird. I don't know why they do that there. And I also don't know if this is the correct way to do it. But oh, it looks like you can also use the .env file. So let's try it again. I'm going to click submit and let's see if it actually makes a request to anywhere. Go ahead and close out of this, click submit. It does request to data muse still. And the reason it's doing a request to data muse is because I probably don't have a .env file set up. So let's just do .env. I'm gonna go ahead and say like HTTP localhost of 10,000. And again, I'm kind of going off track here. Like I just wanted to kind of share some things and just teach you some things um, and just kind of walk you through my thought process of like, it's okay to like go off on tangents and try to figure out different things. Um, cause it kind of shows that, you know, what you're talking about, but in this case, I don't think I even know what I'm talking about because I can't get this API URL to show up here. Uh, so the question is, is how do I import this env stuff? Vt uses .env to load additional environment variables from the following files in your directory. Okay. I have a .env and they're saying you can use it like this. Only Vite, some key will be exposed as this to your client source code. Okay, so um, you have to put the Vite prefix in front of it, which means that I have to go back to my .env and I have to do this, which, you know, you learn something new every day. This is kind of how it works in Next.js, um, but let's just run this real quick. Let's try it again. All I want to do is crash when I do a submit. That's it. There. Okay. So it's doing a request to that, that uh, .env environment variable we set up. And I just wanted to kind of show that, um, you know, we can abstract our code away a little bit and make it a little bit cleaner. So let's just go ahead and go back and get that data muse fallback. I'm going to put that there. So that's going to basically use this if it's set. Otherwise, if I were to go ahead and just clear this out and restart my server, it's going to do the right endpoint, I think. Um, okay, maybe I need to make this an empty string. Uh, 
Okay, what is going on here? I just had to do like a hard refresh on my page for some reason. But it is, okay, it's still doing a request to this endpoint, which I guess I should just delete that completely from my .env so that it'll fall back. There we go. All right, you know, you, you're using a new build system, new bundler, whatever V it is, and uh, you're onto some new things and you learn some new things. But if you can show that you know how to learn like as you're doing stuff, I think that's good. But anyway, I think the next part is I want to add one more feature where I can click on any of these words and I want to update this and resubmit. Okay, so I can keep on getting like synonyms for different words. So let's try doing that. How would I do that? And sorry for distracting you all with that .env stuff. I hope that was actually useful to hear me rant about. Um, so when someone clicks on one of these words, I'm going to say on click, and I'm going to say handle synonym clicked like that. And we want to pretend like there's a function up here that takes in one argument. So I'm going to go ahead and pass in the synonym here. And then we're going to go ahead and just make a function like this. And this could be a string. So synonym is a string. And when you click on it, what we want to do is we want to refetch that data from the back end. Okay, so we could potentially just copy and paste this. This is not the best approach because now we have like duplicate code and we strive to keep our code dry for the most part, right? Don't repeat yourself. Or if you want to follow the other acronym of write everything twice, well, we just wrote the exact same code twice. So let's abstract this to another function. I will say fetch synonyms and that'll take in a, a word, could be a string, and that could basically just call this method. And we're going to basically call that here with word and delete that. And we're going to call this here with word. Uh, I'm going to rename this to word instead of synonym. So now we have like this code that's abstracted a way of how to actually fetch this data. And we don't have to worry about duplicating it in multiple places. So let's try it again. I'm going to type in like the word hot, click enter, and then I'll click fast. And let's see what happens. It actually. Uh, it printed out rel underscore sin object of object. So let's try to figure out why that happened. Because this one, okay, well, if you trust TypeScript, TypeScript is actually yelling at me saying I'm passing the wrong thing. So sometimes I do that. I work too fast, but I should basically be doing synonym.word and passing that to the on click. So now let's try it again. We'll do hot and we'll click on new. And that actually refetched the data. If I click on raw, we got some new data. Click on green. Okay. Now one thing I'll notice is that the hot is not updating. So why is that not updating? Well, because we didn't update the state here. So let's just go ahead and say set word um, of word. Now one thing I will say is that I'm overloading a variable name. Here is word, and then I'm also up, um, overloading like word. So I would rename this to like new word so that you're not um, potentially confusing yourself with that overloading of the name. Um, this one's fine because like the word gets set and then we submit the form, but this one is passed in and we should probably not do that. So let's try it again. Let's just click common and that updates this. Uh, let's go and click shared and that updates that. Okay. And then you could take it potentially to one more step further. Um, if you want to show that like you like to abstract your API into a different folder and I could make one called fetch synonyms here could be like a TS file. And we're just going to abstract that function away um, so that the URL and the way that the data is fetched from the back end, like we don't want our components to really know or have to know about how data is fetched, right? Because you, you can be using Axios, so you can be using fetch. Um, you don't want this API URL hard coded in here. So let's just go ahead and paste that up there. And instead, I'm just going to go ahead and return uh, this and not call set synonyms. Um, I will say I'm not sure why this thing is complaining. Fetch synonyms uh, .ts cannot be compiled under isolate modules because it is considered a global. Oh, okay. So we made a new file. Make sure you export your function. And when you export your function, you can actually use it here. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and import it from an API directory. And then I'm going to go ahead and say .then set 
synonyms like this. Okay, so it's a little bit more code here, but the reason we're doing that is again to abstract this component away from like how it fetches the synonyms. Now you can take it another step further if you want and show like a loading screen while these things are fetching. Actually, let's make sure this thing works. I'll do hot. Looks good. Hit close. That's good as well. So if you want to show that you know how to like make custom hooks and abstract that away, you can take it to another level. I could say like make a folder called hooks and I'm going to say make a, a file called use uh, it synonyms or something. And what this is going to do is going to export a custom hook called use git synonyms. And that's going to be a function that takes in a word. And the reason we're doing this is we want to abstract the way this state here. So I'm going to go ahead and just cut that state out, paste it in. And then we could also potentially we could cut this out or we could just make it um, public. It'd probably, probably be better to make it here. Um, I'm going to import the use state from this custom hook. This word's going to be a string. And what this thing's going to do, it's going to return a function that is going to basically load the synonyms. And it's also going to keep track of if the synonyms are loading, right? So I'm going to go ahead and say is loading, set is loading. And then this is going to be another state variable. Now what I'm doing right here is exactly like what React query will do for you. But I just want to show that if you can kind of explain why we're doing this and how this helps, it's because we want to have a generic way to just show a spinner while the synonyms are being fetched and refreshed and then show the data when it comes in. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I need to basically expose a method here called like fetch or git, I'll call it like git synonyms. And when you call it, it's going to be a function that is going to take in a word. Actually, this one doesn't need to be word here. I'll just go ahead and do this. This one could be a word um, that's going to be a string. And this one's actually going to do the API call. So I, I can actually take this code out like so. And I could simply just do that. Import that API from there. And I'm going to go ahead and just return fetch synonyms. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and just do the whole thing. Let me, let me just copy this out. Now, what I'm doing, I could just be going off the deep end and like overcomplicating the, the problem because I did solve it technically. But I want to show that there's different ways that you can basically do this. So when this thing is called, I'm going to go ahead and say set loading of false. And then when it's done, I want to say set loading of true. And you know, actually, I think this, I need to do it backwards. Uh, it needs to be loading of true and then set loading of false, like this. Okay, so when it's done getting the synonyms, it basically puts them in a state variable here, and I'm going to expose those over here. Okay, so we have a cool little custom hook. I don't know if this works, we'll figure it out. But now what I wanna do is I wanna pull in the synonyms. I wanna pull in is loading synonyms and get synonyms. And this could be equal to the use get synonyms function like this. And now what I can do is just call this function here and also call it down here. And I believe this should work the exact same way, but I am going to show a loading state if something's loading. So I'm going to go ahead and say if loading, then I would just make a div that has loading dot 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 in it. Pretty simple. And then I'm going to go ahead and just do a comma there or colon there and save my page. All right. So now we have the page. I'm going to type in hot and we should see loading pop up and it did. And then it went away. Now when I click on fresh, it goes away and to kind of visualize this, you can kind of show your Chrome browser chops and like slow this down to fast 3G. And now as I click on different synonyms, you'll see that loader pop up and stuff will kind of be updated. Cool, so I think that's basically solving the problem. We implemented a simple little application that fetches data from the back end. We have the ability to click on things and have it refetch the data. We added a cool custom hook to show a spinner. We abstracted away some API logic and put it in an API directory so that our components aren't coupled to how the data is fetched. All it cares about is how does the data get there. We have a custom hook that is used for, you know, um, also abstracting away, you know, where or how the data is fetched. It just comes from state. 
And when you call get synonyms, that's put onto state and you can use it in a more reactive manner. And I think that's pretty much it. So again, like, hopefully you guys learned something from this. I just wanted to share a little like a problem with you all that you could potentially get asked a similar question like this on an interview for like a junior position. Being able to walk through some of these thought processes and kind of explain them out loud, I think is just a good selling point with your experience and how you can kind of problem solve and also walk others through your problem solving tech techniques, I guess. Anyway, have a good day. Uh, if you want to join me in Discord and ask me questions or if you have other like kind of quiz, interview, react questions that you want me to try to do on video, let me know. Uh, send me a message, leave a comment or whatever. Otherwise, have a good day and happy coding.